Hi everybody, this is Julian from Hugging Face. As we all know, it can be challenging to build a high quality model that our business use case expects. And in the last few months, a new technique has become increasingly popular to try and build those high quality models with less complexity, uh, faster turnaround times, and less compute cost. And this technique is called model merging. So in this video, we're going to introduce what model merging is and we're going to look at the most popular algorithms that have been designed for model merging and that are implemented in an open source library called MergeKit. Okay, so pretty interesting topic, very different from how we've built models before. And I guess let's get started. If you enjoy this video, please give it a thumbs up and consider subscribing to my YouTube channel. And if you do, please don't forget to enable notifications so that you won't miss anything in the future. Also, why not share this video on your social networks or with your colleagues? Because if you enjoyed it, it's quite likely someone else will. Thank you very much for your support. So what's the problem that model merging is trying to solve? And what is model merging and how does it work? Well, hopefully we're going to answer all that. So as we know, um, trying to build the one great model that works best for a particular use case is not very easy. Uh, it takes time, it takes many iterations, probably many fine tuning rounds, probably different fine tuning or alignment data sets, and certainly uh, it takes time and it takes compute and it takes energy. And um, there is such a thing as diminishing returns as we keep trying to improve the model. So it's, it's quite a bit of effort and uh, if we need to do this again and again and again for each project, then um, this can be difficult to scale. So something different uh, is, is required, and I guess that's what model merging is about. Uh, trying to find another way to build high quality models. So the, the basic idea is really, um, we have tons of good models out there. We have about half a million models on the hub, for the, the best architectures, fine-tuned on all kinds of data sets. So chances are that the, the abilities that I need from, uh, from my model are present out there. Uh, and maybe they're present in different models. Maybe one model can summarize legal documents. Maybe another model can translate um, healthcare documents. Why not? And maybe I need both, right? Maybe I want to build those different abilities in my model. So instead of trying to uh, fine tune a single model on different data sets and try to uh, teach it different things, can I learn from existing models? And that's really what model merging is about. We're going to try and identify good models that know things we're interested in and merge them into a single one, hoping that the merge model retains all the goodness pres present in the, in the source models, right? So that's what model merging is about, uh, trying to combine several task-specific models into a single model that we hope will be multitask. And we're going to do this without any kind of training and fine-tuning. This will purely be, I would say, uh, a mathematical operation where we take the weights coming from those different models and merge them using a particular algorithm. So this is not an ensembling technique. Okay, ensembling means uh, we have a collection of models that predict in parallel, and then we do some kind of uh, either averaging or or uh, fine tuning on the outputs, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, nothing of the sort here. Um, we do start from several models, but at the end there is only one model left. The good thing about merging is um, there is no training involved, there is no fine tuning involved. Uh, we only need a tiny bit of compute and everything runs very nicely on CPU, right? Um, so it is a very lightweight process. It's fast, uh, merging doesn't take a whole bunch of uh, <laughs> uh, GPU hours, not at all. Um, you can run this in maybe a few minutes, uh, depending on model size on your, uh, on your local machine. Um, there's no extra cost for training, uh, there's no extra cost for inference because at the end of the day, 
we're still predicting with a single model, right? Uh, and there is no extra inference latency. Um, it's just, uh, I guess, a vanilla model, right? There's no trick. There's no nothing on top of the merge model. So this is a really, really interesting technique. The most popular library to do this at the moment is called MergeKit. Uh, and, um, and the founder of uh, MergeKit has actually joined a, a machine learning startup called RC, uh, started by a, a bunch of ex-hogging face folks. Hi guys, good job on this one. Uh, and feel free to look at MergeKit. So we're not gonna dive into MergeKit per se. Um, they have good examples on their, uh, in their repo. Um, it's uh, reasonably easy to, to get started with, but we're gonna look at the techniques that are actually implemented in MergeKit and we're going to focus on understanding those different algorithms, okay? And maybe I'll show a couple of uh, code snippets from MergeKit and maybe a couple of config files. All right, so these are the merging techniques uh, we're going to uh, look at. Um, so the first one is called model soups. Uh, funny name, but you'll see why it's called that way. Then the next one we're going to look at is called slurp, <laughs> spherical linear interpolation, which is actually a very old algo uh, rebooted for uh, AI. Very, very interesting. We're going to look at task arithmetic. Uh, we will look at TIES, uh, which stands for Trim, Elect, Sign, and Merge. Uh, we'll also look at DARE, uh, Drop and Rescale. And last but not least, uh, we'll look at Franken Merging. And uh, well, that's the best name of all, and uh, you don't want to miss that one. It is a bit crazy. Okay, so th these are all available in MergeKit today. Uh, I'm sure more will pop up, but at the time of recording, this is what we have. Um, this is a very active field, and there's a lot of excitement. So um, if you're watching this later, there, there are probably more merging techniques. Maybe I will be covering them too. Okay, so let's talk about model soups. Uh, model soups is, is quite easy to understand. Um, so, and in a way, it's a little bit similar to, uh, to what we did in assembling, where we did train many variants of the same model on the same data set with different hyperparameters. Um, and well, the assumption would be all these models know something about the data. And if we're doing assembling then and, and, and factoring all the different answers, then uh, the weak learners combined should provide a stronger learner. So it kind of starts the same, except again, um, there is only one model in the end. So model soup, uh, means we're going to start from a collection of models, so the same model architecture trained on the same data set multiple times with different hyperparameters. Okay, so it kind of starts the same as assembling. But then uh, we take all those different variants and we average their uh, model weights. Okay, so literally computing an average on the model parameters. And there are different ways to do this, as we'll see. But that's the idea. And that's why I call a soup, because we're kind of taking all the ingredients and uh, the fine-tuned models and put them in a big, you know, uh, in a big pot and, uh, and kind of mix everything and hope, uh, well, it's gonna be a good soup. So that's the, that's the uh, I guess, the intuition. Um, this is also called linear interpolation. So optionally, um, we can actually apply weights to the average. So um, let's say we want more, a little more of that model and a little less of that model in the soup. Uh, we, can, uh, we can do that and we can also normalize the weights so that um, all the weights have kind of the same range um, and, uh, and why not want to do that. So the code, and this is actually the, the code snippet from, from MergeKit, uh, is, is exactly what you would think. So um, we take the, the different weights that we optionally assigned to, um, to each model, um, and layer per layer, uh, we just multiply the, the layer weight, and layer by layer, uh, we multiply the parameters, so the tensors, by the, the model weight, and, um, and sum everything, right? So uh, uh, it's kind of a weighted average. And again, if we normalize, 
um, then we apply basic normalization. So it is as simple as this. Uh, as you can see, it is uh, it does not require a ton of compute. <laughs> it's basically uh, an averaging operation on tensors. So you can run this anywhere. So there are different ways to uh, build your soup. There's the uniform soup, where we take all the models uh, we we train with the different hyperparameter combinations and we average them all. Okay, so all the ingredients go into the soup, and there is the greedy soup, where we average models one by one, and every time we add a model to the soup, we evaluate uh, with uh, an evaluation set, and we only keep the model we added if we did improve. The test accuracy right so we keep the good ingredients and 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 leave out the ones uh, that only improve the soup okay so we can do both so on this graph we see different things although on the x-axis uh, we have um, image net accuracy uh, this is a, a computer vision model it's actually a clip model on the y-axis we have accuracy on distribution shifts so that, that means how the model performs when we predict images that are significantly different from the training set. Okay, so the further we go right, the better the models do on ImageNet, and the higher we go, um, the better uh, models behave on data that's uh, different from the training data. So I guess the more uh, uh, the more resilient they are to uh, out of domain data. Okay, and um, so all the green dots are individual models trained on with different hyperparameters. Uh, the blue dot is the the uniform soup. So you can see it's almost the best on ImageNet. There's only one model, one green dot that outperforms it, and it is the best on distribution shifts. Okay, so um, so the model is almost as good as anything else on the original data set and is more resilient than anyone else uh, on, on out of domain data. And um, well, and the greedy soup is, uh, is even better, as you can see, uh, it's, it's much more accurate. That's uh, pretty normal because we only kept the models that did improve accuracy and discarded some of the, like, the bad apples. And, um, and I guess it generalized almost as good as the uniform model on, the, on out of domain data, right? Um, and and generally that's uh, that's something I found in the paper. They say model soups do a little worse than ensembling. So uh, imagine we did ensemble prediction on those uh, all those green dots, which would be crazy expensive because we would have to predict in parallel with with all of these, right? So the infra cost would be would be huge. Um, so I guess it's a really good compromise if we have a single model that is close to the ensemble performance. But generally, uh, the soups are better on out of distribution data, right? So all in all, it is a, it is a really good technique. Here are some benchmarks again from the paper on uh, on BERT and uh, and T5, and um, the top line is the best individual model, so the best green dot, <laughs> and uh, and the bottom line is the greedy soup, and you can see on on those different benchmarks. Um, the the greedy soup um, is as good as or better than the best individual model on on all those benchmarks and and that's pretty cool so model soups very simple very lightweight in terms of compute and very efficient right so enjoy the soup let's move on to the next which is called slurp okay so slurp means spherical linear interpolation then no that's not a typo it is a 1985 algorithm um, and in fact this algo was uh, originally designed for computer graphics um, to find uh, the smoothest path for camera rotations right so imagine a, a camera rotating around the scene um, what's the best, the smoothest path from position A to position B uh, that you can find? Uh, and we'll see what the hell that means in terms of, uh, of AI models. So this one is different in a very important way. Um, 
Slurp only works with two models, okay? And you guess why, because we're going to transition from one to the other, okay? So uh, we're going to work with two models only. So if you need to average, if you need to, uh, so if you need to merge more than two models, um, because you have more abilities that could be found in, in, in the best two models out there, then Slurp is not an option. Um, we can favor one of them, as we'll see. There is a parameter to uh, say, hey, I want more of model A and less of model B, but two models only, okay? The benefit of Slurp um, is, is um, number one, as we'll see, and you'll see a, a, a picture in a minute and it will all make sense. It helps preserve the magnitude of weights because when we do averaging, um, we could have a very large weight in a model, we could have a tiny weight in another model, and when we average to two, then, well, we have kind of this middle value that's not quite, uh, you know, as good as, as what we would have wanted. So that's, that's one problem. Uh, the second problem, and again, uh, here's, the, here's that drawing. If we do slurp, uh, instead of doing uh, linear averaging, uh, which is going to be the red dot uh, on that graph, we're going to do spherical um, interpolation, and that's the blue dot. And so it preserves the, uh, I hate to say the shape, um, but uh, yeah, I'll call it the shape of the embedding space, okay? And I know embeddings are, you know, hundreds, if not thousands of dimensions, and it's impossible to visualize. So try to visualize it in 3D, uh, or imagine, you know, uh, merging uh, values coming from two spheres, you know, what you want in the end is still something like a sphere. And and that's what Slurp will bring you. So if we look at that drawing, okay, imagine P1 and P2 are two, uh, two embeddings, right? Uh, two vectors pointing at different parts of space. If we do uh, uh, the model soup thing, which is just uh, just a basic average, um, then the, the average uh, of P1 and P2 is going to be PL. And so you can see, you know, the magnitude is, is very different. Uh, and you can see uh, the, the curvature, the, the, the overall structure, the overall shape of the embedding space is changed. Uh, it's not so much a sphere anymore. And, um, and so if we do slurp, then uh, somehow we manage to compute PS, which stays on that circle. Okay, and how do we do this? All right, uh, that's probably more than you wanted to know, but again, that's the code from uh, from MergeKit. I uh, just updated it with uh, I just updated the variable names to. Uh, um, so that's the code from MergeKit. Uh, let's let's see what how it works. Uh, so on that second drawing, uh, we're trying to average v0 and v1. Okay, uh, so first of all, we need to figure out. Um, uh, so first of all, we need to normalize them, okay? Uh, so that's uh, simple enough. Then we find the angle between V0 and V1, okay? So compute the dot product, uh, find the angle, uh, uh, theta, right? Uh, the, green, the green angle here. And now we need to find that um, average uh, vector uh, that stays on the circle and that's where you can favor one model or the other. That's this uh, T parameter. So if T is, uh, you know, 0.5, then you'll be in the middle, but you could favor V0 or V1, right? So we compute the, um, the new angle, the middle ground angle using the T parameter, okay? So uh, V0 to new vector is gonna be uh, T theta and new vector to v1 is going to be 1 minus t theta, okay? Again, if uh, t is 0.5, then you are in the middle, okay? So once we've figured out um, the direction of that new vector, um, then uh, we just apply um, that uh, theta angle. Then we just apply that t theta angle to figure it out. And... Um, and we use the original vectors, the non-normalized vectors, to compute the new vector. Okay, so that's the that's the basic idea. It's super simple, and again, you can see from a, from a compute perspective, it is really lightweight. 
uh, just a tiny bit of uh, trigonometry, but uh, all that stuff will run nicely on uh, on CPU, right? So same ID as model soup, except uh, we stay on the circle. Again, that's the 2D thing. And we'd stay on the sphere for 3D and then for uh, 1536 <laughs> dimensions. God knows where we are, but you get the intuition. Okay, so slurp generally uh, uh, a little better um, at, um, at averaging and merging. Only problem is uh, we can only do two models. Okay, so that's slurp. Now let's talk about task arithmetic. So as we know, pre-trained models can be fine-tuned for a lot of different tasks. Um, NLP, computer vision, audio, etc., etc. Okay, so plenty of tasks, and that's also why we have half a million models on the Hugging Face Hub. And they can be fine-tuned also on many different data sets. So a task vector is... Uh, the tensor updates, the collection of tensor updates or model updates that are applied to a pre-trained model during fine-tuning. Okay, so we start from a pre-trained model and then we, let's say we fine-tune it for text classification on uh, customer emails, right? We're going to update a lot of the weights during that fine-tuning process. And so those updates, the, the deltas, right? are uh, what we call the task vector. So obviously, because we can fine tune on many tasks and many data sets, we can easily produce lots of task vectors. Okay, so we could fine tune on 50 text classification data sets or 50 image classification data sets, etc, etc. And each time, we would be able to easily compute the task vector for that particular fine-tuning job, okay? So now instead of looking at a collection of pre-trained models, uh, fine-tuned, you know, thousands of times, we could be looking at a collection of task vectors, right? Because in the end, we don't care so much about the pre-trained model, we don't care so much about the fine-tuned model, we care about what changed, and that's the task vector, okay? And the cool thing, and that's why it's called task arithmetic, is we can add or subtract those task vectors to a base model to add or remove capabilities, right? So if we take a task vector for, I don't know, a Llama 7B model and, um, and add it, to uh, one of our own Llama 7B models, then the hypothesis is that update, that task vector that we add, is adding this new ability to our model. And similarly, we could remove capabilities. Let's say we have an image classification model that's been trained on you know, cars and animals and everyday objects, and we want to improve its accuracy on, on cars and we want to add motorcycles. Well, uh, we would add a task vector for motorcycles that comes from uh, another model that was trained on motorcycle images, right? And maybe we would subtract everyday objects with another task vector because we're not interested in that. So in the end, we would have a model that learns through the new task vector how to classify motorcycle images and by removing the everyday objects we would generally improve how it classifies cars as well right so that's the the cool intuition behind task arithmetic and you could wonder wow is this is this really working and and yes uh so um so on this graph uh, we see uh, the result of adding task vectors to a clip a model so uh, an image uh, transformer on the, at the top, we see the accuracy on ImageNet. On the bottom, we see the accuracy on uh, another target task uh, that we added. And you can see the, the data sets uh, on, the, on the X uh, axis, okay? So the orange bars are the pre-trained model. So the, you know, the, I guess the baseline model. And you can see generally, well, the, the baseline model doesn't do really great. 
on any of those uh, new data sets. Um, the green bars are the fine-tuned model. So let's say we take clip and fine-tune it on the cars uh, data set or the Eurostat data set. Well, obviously it does well, but at the expense of a full fine-tuning job. And the blue bars are the task vector, which is really just that operation we explained where we start from the pre-trained model, so the, the orange bar, so to speak, and we just add the task vector, which you know takes a few seconds. And you can see um, those task vector models uh, are on par or just a tiny bit uh, below the full fine-tuned model. Again, um, without going through a full fine-tuning job. Okay, so that's pretty cool because we can get to fine-tuning accuracy without the time and effort and cost of a full fine-tuning. Okay, uh, here's another example where they add uh, pairs of tasks to uh, the T5 base model. And so you can see those dotted lines are the, um, the, the, the base accuracy on, on task one and task two, okay? Uh, so for the uh, for fine-tuned model, okay? So again, at the expense of a full fine-tuning job. And we can see, uh, so it's, you could say, hit and miss, right? Um, so everything in the, uh, I would say, uh, lower, um, uh, a bottom left quadrant is not so good because it's below uh, the fine-tuned accuracy for our, uh, both tasks. But anything uh, in, the, in the top quadrants or anything in the bottom right quadrant is doing better on, uh, on one task at least, right? So we can see some of the models are actually um, close to... Um, uh, fine-tuning accuracy for one of the tasks and much better on the other one, right? So not as impressive as on the clip um, model, but still pretty good. So that's task arithmetic, right? Adding or removing um, task vectors, so model deltas, to uh, one of your models. Okay, let's go on. So the next one is called ties. So ties um, is a bit different. So ties starts uh, by noticing that there's a problem when we merge uh, models using um, maybe uh, model soups or maybe uh, when we merge with a slurp um, or even, I guess, uh, with a task arithmetics. There's this thing called parameter interference. Okay, so... Here's an example. So they, they highlight two major problems. The first one is what they call the influential versus redundant parameter. Okay. And, um, and that means the two parameters that you're averaging in what, so in model one, let's say this parameter is actually highly influential. So it has a, you know, maybe it has a larger magnitude. And in the other model, it's not important at all. So it has a really low magnitude. So when you actually merge the two, um, then you kind of cancel uh, the influence of the parameter in model one, right? So that's, that's a problem you have. Um, the other problem is sign conflicts, where some parameters could be you know, positive and they're equivalent parameter in the other model could be negative and again adding the two cancel things out okay so that's i guess something you cannot control you know you don't know if it's going to happen or not you don't know how badly it's going to happen uh etc cetera, etc cetera. but generally they find that uh you know averaging can cause one of those problems and you can see uh, you can see an example in uh, in this graph where uh you know um, so you have two uh, two series of uh, of uh, three things here. So the the left one with the square is fine. You know you have uh, for example here you have two uh, you have that uh, pink and and purple parameters. We have I would say uh, 
about the same magnitude, about the same uh, and the same sign. So when you average them, that's okay. You get something that works. In the middle, you have the round uh, thing where you have a a very uh, a tiny pink um, parameter saying it as you know low influence, and then you have a much more important, much more influential purple parameter. And again, if you just average the two, you get something that's kind of uh, you know cancelled out. And uh, and then if on the third example uh, with the polygon you see uh, one parameter strongly positive, the other one is mildly negative, and again, uh, if you just average things out, uh, you get something with uh, with a low magnitude, and and probably you destroyed uh, the strong influence of that uh, large uh, purple parameter. Okay, and that's what ties is trying to solve. Okay, so ties mean trim. Elect sign and merge. So let's try and so this is so this is a little bit busy. Let's try and, and break things out. So let's go from left to right. So in the first task vectors box, uh, you see uh, three models being merged. Okay, there's the pink one, the purple one, and the brownish one. Okay, and you can see we have very different uh, configuration. So we have five sets uh, of three parameters that we want to merge. So the first step is to trim each. Uh, so the first task, so the first step is to trim each group of parameters that we're going to merge to keep only the influential parameters. Okay. So what that really means is we're going to discard the the parameters that have a really small magnitude. Okay. So you can see. Uh, in the second box called trim task vectors, right? The first group of parameters we eliminated uh, the purple and the brown parameters because they were really small compared to uh, to the pink one. Same for group number two, we only kept the large uh, brown parameter. For group number three, we eliminated the small uh, brown parameter. Group four, uh, we didn't trim anything. And group five, we trimmed the small uh, uh, blue or purple and and pink parameters. Okay, so we drop uh, we drop the smaller values, and that's uh, that's a parameter you can control. Okay, so now we eliminated the I would say the redundant parameters. Okay, um, second step is to figure out the signs. So for each group of parameters, we need to decide if we want to stick with positive values or negative values. So that's the elect sign path you see here. So the first group of parameters is very simple. Uh, we only have one left, so it's positive. So sign is positive. Same for the second group. Third group, we have a large negative uh, purple parameter and uh, I would say a, a medium large uh, positive parameter. So the overall sign here would be negative because the largest magnitude comes from that uh, negative purple parameter. So sign is negative. In the fourth group, uh, sign is positive because you know we tend to go towards the positive more than towards the negative. The negative. And in group five, there's only one parameter, so it's an easy choice. So once we have the sign vector. Okay, then we know uh, we're going to uh, eliminate the uh, the parameters that don't, don't have the right sign. Okay, so for the third group, we eliminate the uh, pink parameter, and for the fourth group, we eliminate the pink parameter again. And then we merge whatever's left. Okay, um, and and compute the averages. So that's the basic idea, right? Uh, get rid of the of the non-influential parameters in the trim step. Figure out the sign, uh, the dominant sign, in the elect sign step, and then uh, just merge whatever's left. Okay. And so once we've done that, then uh, well, we have our uh, our update, and we add those uh, average parameters to the original model. Okay, so we apply the update to the to the the baseline model we want to uh, 
to add abilities to. And there's a scale factor again to decide how much you want to influence the old behavior or the new behavior, so to speak. Here are some benchmarks on uh, different models. So we have T5 and we have the Vision Transformer. And uh, we see a comparison between averaging, um, which is basically model soup, uh, and uh, task arithmetic, which we, we just discussed. And we have two scenarios. Um, the first group with the, the red uh, uh, crosses are, we don't have a validation set, so we just you know, apply the, the algorithm without any kind of evaluation. So we just use baseline parameters, uh, hyperparameters for, uh, uh, for trimming, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so much more of a static operation. And we see mostly, this is still improving, um, except on, on T5 base. But uh, we are uh, doing better than averaging. We are doing better than uh, task arithmetic. And uh, we're still not as good as a, a fully fine-tuned model, but uh, we're, uh, we're not too bad. And in the second group, the bottom group, uh, we're uh, improving across the board uh, and generally doing, uh, doing much better when we have a validation set because we can try different, I guess, runs and figure out what the right hyperparameters for trimming are. Okay, so that's uh, that's an interesting technique uh, as well, and it's called ties. Okay, let's move on to the next one, which is called dare. Okay, so dare is pretty cool, um, and it actually realizes that when we run. Uh, fine-tuning we do update a lot of parameters but as it turns out it looks like a lot of those updates are redundant so they're useless we're actually tweaking lots of parameters lots of weights that don't make any difference okay I guess that's just another sign that uh, you know, models have too many parameters and uh, it's all too you know brute force really but Okay, until we find something better. So dare means drop and rescale. So the dropping bit is easy to understand. Uh, we randomly eliminate uh, up to 99% of the parameter updates. So we don't eliminate the parameters themselves. It's not uh, pruning, right? But we, we eliminate the updates. So we stick to the original weights of the fine-tuned model. 99%, imagine that, okay? We only keep 1% of those actual updates. Um, and those updates are then rescaled according to how many we, we dropped, right? So um, because we have fewer updates, so they need to be impactful. So if we eliminated 99% uh, of those updates, then we're going to rescale by a factor of 100. Okay, so fewer updates, but very large updates. Interestingly, the larger the model is, um, the, the, the more limited, uh, the more negligible the impact of dropping all those updates is. And here's the, the proof from the paper. Okay, so you see uh, two different data sets, uh, GSM 8K on the left, math, uh, math data set, on different models, 7B, 13B, 70B. And you can see the 7B model hurts <laughs> pretty badly once we start dropping, let's say, 75% of the, of the parameter updates. The 13B model hurts a little later, I guess, when we start dropping more than 10%. Uh, more, I'm sorry, when we start dropping more than 90%. But the 70B model is almost, you know, unfazed. Um, and again, I think that goes to show how over-parameterized those things are. Uh, you can drop 99% of the updates. Um, almost nothing happens. And we kind of see the same on, uh, on the Human Eval, which, uh, which is a coding, uh, coding data set, again, on Wizard Coder and Llama 2 fine-tune on code. About the same, uh, about the same story. Uh, the small models hurt really badly, 
And, uh, and interestingly, the larger models even improve. Right? You can see the 13B and uh, the 34B model actually get better when we drop those updates. So just less noise, I guess. So that's the drop and rescale, okay? Uh, ignore a ton of those updates. Uh, just rescale the one you keep, make them more impactful. And, uh, and for larger models, this has no impact, except, of course, the size of the task vectors are much, much, uh, except the size of this, uh, the task vectors is now much smaller, right? Because we literally drop 90, maybe 99% of the updates. So the task vectors become really tiny and much easier to, to manage, okay? And they can be applied um, using previous methods uh, like uh, ties or, or uh, any other method uh, that we saw before. Okay, so there in itself is not a is not a merging technique. It's really uh, it's uh, it's uh, a task vector uh, compression or you know shrinking technique, and so that means we can have tiny task vectors that we very easily, very quickly manage and add to um, um, to baseline models. And uh, here's uh, here's the result. So this is uh, this is a little hard to figure out took me a while okay so we have three models okay we have the blue uh, large language model we have the green math model and we have the pinkish uh, code model okay and um, at the top we see their uh, their metrics on their uh, respective data sets okay and then uh, we take uh, those models and start combining them so we take the language model and we add a dare update for math. Okay, and that gives you that split, uh, you know, blue-green line. Um, and you can see this is actually uh, this is actually improving on the Alpaca Eval 67.45. And this is actually doing quite well on math, 66.26, um, uh, um, which is actually better than the 64.22 of the single math model, which I find really interesting. And then we do the same for language model and code and math and code. And at the bottom, we do all three. So we have the language model and the math and the code. And uh, amazingly, when we use there, we see that uh, we have the highest of all alpaca evals accuracy, uh, 69.28. So again, uh, you can try all those different combinations and see that you know sometimes um, you can actually improve the base model by adding other abilities that might seem a little bit unrelated, right? Uh, we add uh, math and code to the language model and uh, and it actually becomes a better language model uh, so that's uh, that's quite interesting while being still uh, pretty good at math and and code okay so that's the that's the thing uh, and uh, and that's how combining dare with uh, uh, with task arithmetic in this case can help you quickly build models um, that are multitask uh, and sometimes even improving on the original uh, score for a particular task, right? So pretty cool. Okay, the last one I want to talk about is the fantastic Franken merging, of course, named after Frankenstein and you'll see why. So all those previous techniques we discussed require that the models that are, that are merged share a common, a common architecture. Because obviously, if you're going to average or you know, add or subtract parameters, uh, the, the layers need to match, the, the tensor sizes need to match, or you, you know, all those need to be T5s, or all, need, all those need to be you know, llama, 2, 7Bs, etc., etc. Okay? Fair enough. But how about we take bits and pieces from different models, uh, possibly with different architectures, and stitch them together? Okay, so this time we are not averaging anything. Uh, we are leaving the weights untouched. And this is also called uh, 
passed through merging, so the parameters themselves are unchanged. What we are doing is cherry picking layers from model A and model B, and they're recombining layers from different models, right? Which sounds a little bit crazy, and obviously that's you know that's the Frankenstein thing. It is highly experimental, um, but amazingly, some interesting models are popping up. Uh, and on the uh, the Hugging Face LLM leaderboard, some good models have showed up, um, and uh, and using uh, you know Franken Franken merging. But there's actually a good list now uh, on the hub, so just go to the to the models on the hub and look for Franken, and you will find a good list of those models, and you can see how they've been built. Here's an example. Uh, this one is Goliath 120B which is actually a merge of two different Llama 2 7 billion models. Okay, so we are not merging the weights. Remember, we are picking layers from one model or the other. Okay, so here the two models have the same architecture, but as you can see in, uh, in, in the list here, the first um, uh, 17 layers come from the XWIN model, and then the next come from the uh, Uriel, whatever, uh, however you pronounce that. Uh, and then Xquin again, and then et cetera, et cetera. So that's the Franken merging thing. We take layers from one model and, and layers from another model, and we, you know, we stitch them together. Um, so again, go and look on the hub. You, you will find uh, different examples. You will actually find different model architectures being stitched which is a little bit crazy, but uh, again, um, if, if they score high on the benchmarks um, and, uh, and they haven't been contaminated by the evaluation data sets, which is just another discussion here, uh, well, there's got to be a reason for that. Okay, so Frank and Merging, um, not sure I would actually do this in production, probably not, but Again, interesting technique, and you never know, right? Uh, sometimes uh, really weird ideas lead to uh, to breakthroughs, and you never know. This could be one of them. All right, that's really what I wanted to tell you about model merging. As you can see, it's very different, and it can get pretty wild, but I think it's something we should all keep an eye on, and I'm sure we'll discuss this more in the future. Again, thank you very much for your support. Give the video a thumbs up if you enjoyed it, and until the next video, Keep rocking.